Okay, morning all. Uh, hopefully everybody's okay. So back for second session of sales. Uh, I think last time we covered, uh, we looked at eukaryotic cells, we looked at prokaryotic, we looked at different types of cells. So we looked at the structure of animal cells, we looked at plant cells, we did bacteria and the sort of key differences between them. We looked at uh, specialised cells and we said that actually the key idea with these is to be able to talk about the adaptations and how those adaptations help them do their job properly. Now we will come back and have a look at those a bit more in the next when we look at biology too. We then went on, morning Poppy, morning Ollie. Uh, we then went on and we had a look at diffusion, osmosis and active transport. We spent quite a bit of time looking around those areas. Morning Olivia. So we had quite a look at yeah, had a bit of time looking at those. So the plan for today then is we're going to start off looking at microscopes. Morning, Mia. We're going to start off looking at microscopes, uh, how they're used, the different parts of them. We'll have a look at the sort of magnification of those as well. Morning, Amy. Um, we will then have a look. So I'm just going to look across at the screen because my notes are on the other one at the moment. Uh, we're going to have a look at cell division. So we'll talk about mitosis as well. We're going to talk about uh, aseptic testing, so ways of actually sampling and dealing with uh, microorganisms, I suppose, and staying safe. Uh, it was one of the jobs I used to do years ago before I became a teacher. God, it seems almost in a different life now, but when I used to work in the brewery. So aseptic testing techniques and one of the other required practicals that comes up in triple is in that. So we'll have a talk about that as well. Um, and then we'll come on to stem cells, what they are, how they're used. Um, some of the issues around them um, and there's some quite cool sort of medical developments with those at the moment so it's still quite new technology so let's make a start uh, let's actually go for blue so typical microscope um, i suppose probably more advanced than some of the ones you've seen at school uh, we've got two eyepieces on this one rather than one but we've got our eyepieces here um, the eye lens is quite important because one of the magnification types actually comes into the eyepiece lens here as well. So I think the ones we have at school are about times four for that. Morning, Ben. We've got the objective lens. Now, with this, we've got this the objective lenses we can rotate round. We can adjust the magnification. We normally start off on a fairly low magnification. So just for the case of this one, I'm going to put down times 10. Um, they often go up to sort of times 40, sometimes a bit more than that. Uh, but we'll talk about that as we go through. We have a coarse focus. And we have a fine focus. Oh, that is a U, honest. We got a lamp or a light source. Let's just put light source in there. This is the stage. Uh, we have clips. The handle is here. <coughs> so those are the main sort of types, uh, or sorry, the main parts of this. Now, when we're using these, as I already said, we start off with the lowest objective lens possible. Um, this, in this case, will give a magnification of times 40. So if we wanted to work out the magnification here, and this will be the sort of total mag, then actually what we'd be doing is multiplying the eyepiece or the eye lens uh, to the objective. So we've got 4 times 10, so our total magnification is going to be times 40. So whatever we look at through the eyepiece on the microscope, We'll have times 40. So the clips here are to hold the slides in. So we should know we've got our glass slides. We will generally want to put our sample on there. And our sample is normally going to be very, very thin. Now, some microscopes will actually give a top down light as well, or we can use a lamp. The ones that we generally use, because we want to try and have a look through the cells and look inside the cells. They shine the light up through. So if our samples are too thick, then actually the light doesn't go through, so we can't see anything. So we want them to be very, very thin. 
We will then have a cover slip that goes on top. And we will often sometimes put a die on there. And there's different dies we use depending on the type of sample uh, and depends on the organelles that we want to be shown up. So we'll often dye things um, just to make it more visible when we actually look at through the microscope. <coughs> so those will go onto the stage. We'll hold them in place with a clip. Sometimes some microscopes like this one here, and I'll just do a little arrow here. They're quite cool because rather than having to try and move the uh, slide around manually, we can actually use those to move the position of the stage or to move the slide on the stage uh, to try and find what we want to. So it's a lot more accurate than trying to use our fingers, which sometimes get uh, a little bit clumsy. So we, will, when we're using the microscope, what we generally do is we wind the course focus up without looking through the eyepiece. So the stage is as high as possible. And we bring this up so the slide is almost touching the objective lens. Then when we come to focus it, we're going to dial it down rather than moving the slide up, the stage up. Now, the reason we do this is if we start with the stage down and go up, when we're looking through the eyepiece, we don't actually know how close the slide is getting to the eyepiece, uh, sorry, getting to the objective lens. Uh, and what can happen quite frequently, I've done it myself, is that you can wind up and you hear a crack, and that crack is where the slide's just been broken by the objective lens. So we wind it up and then we sort of dial it down. And we start off with a coarse focus until it comes into focus. And then the fine focus gives very, very small movements, moving the stage up and down, just to bring it into the best focus we possibly can. So we would start off with the lowest magnification on the objective lens, and then we would move on to a higher magnification, and we'd refocus as we need to. Now, we shouldn't need to move the stage too much to refocus it in this case, but it does help by starting small, we can find the item, we can get it focused. So... You do need to make sure that you know all the different parts of the, the microscope, uh, the purpose of each of those parts, uh, and also the stages for creating some form of slide and then actually getting a clear image for that. Some microscopes as well, I know the ones we've got at school do, they have um, a sort of diaphragm, they call it here, which is a way of adjusting the light intensity so we can actually have more or less light going through as we need to. So let's just move that. Now, when I was working in, in industry, we would have to prepare microbe samples, and then we could have a look at, under the microscope at those micro samples uh, to work out what they are, to try and get a clear image, um, sometimes to try and count colonies. But we had to make sure that we were growing those uh, cultures, those micro colonies, making sure that we stay safe and also trying to avoid contamination. So I'm just gonna give a new title here. Now, sterility is really, really important. We, if I can drop a picture in quite quickly with this one. Just drop that in here for a minute. Trying to get a sample is actually quite simple. We will generally have some form of agar, and agar is just a jelly that contains nutrients. And bacteria are fairly easy to grow, really. I mean, in fact, a lot of the microorganisms, not just bacteria, we can grow fairly quickly, fairly easily if we have some form of jelly. Now, this doesn't work for viruses because virus, uh, viruses need a host cell in order for them to grow. But if we're looking at yeast, if we're looking at fungi, if we're looking at bacteria, then all we really need is some form of jelly with the correct nutrients in. Uh, they will be a sort of moist uh, surface. They've got everything they need. And then all we have to do then is keep them at the right temperature. Now, when we're preparing our agar, we will boil it up to make sure that everything inside it is killed. So there are no microorganisms alive. We will pour it into sterile Petri dishes. So these plastic dishes, these are our Petri dishes. So when we're doing this, everything we're doing is kept as sterile as possible. The inoculating loop, this is just a piece of wire. It's often nichrome, um, but it's just a piece of wire that we can use. And then obviously we've got our bacterial solution here. This isn't sterile, otherwise there'd be no bacteria living. Uh, it sounds obvious, hopefully, but I know um, I have seen people in questions make sure that everything is sterile, including this. 
nothing would grow at that point. So in this case, this would be a case that would be us sampling um, a sample that's already got the bacteria we know. Now, when I was working in the food industry, we would have to sample everything. So if we've just cleaned tanks, we'd want to make sure the tanks were clean to make sure there was no bacteria, um, no other pathogens, no other microorganisms that could compete with the yeast uh, in the beer products we were making. We would also have to make sure that all the production lines were uncontaminated um, and everything was being cleaned to a purpose. So in that case, we wouldn't use the inoculating loop. We would go around, we would have special swabs uh, and we would have... Uh, in some cases, it would be a very, very fine filter, I suppose, that you would be able to run a, a liquid through and that would be able to collect any of the microorganisms in there. And that would do the same thing. And then we could drop that on top of the agar dish and they would actually grow onto the filter in that case. But all of these samples are going to be kept sterile. Sterilising the inoculating loop is really easy. We just pass it through a flame. So I've got another picture I'm going to drop in. All of these pictures are straight from the AQA exam board. So they're all ones that have been in previous exams. <coughs> so, sorry, I'm going to drink. So what we're looking at here is we're assuming that everything's been sterilised. The inoculating loop has been passed through a flame to make sure that's sterile. And what we're doing is we're then going to dip it into our bacterial culture here. And we're going to wipe it over the surface of our agar. Now, we're going to do this very gently. It's one of the most common mistakes people make is actually they put too much pressure. Uh, and all this does is just gouges the jelly and then it doesn't really work. So we're going to wipe it over. One of the techniques we can do. Now, have I got a circle on here or not? Yeah, I have. So one of the um, techniques we can actually do is we actually start off, oh, get rid of that. To start with, we're gonna have a very, very concentrated solution on that um, wire loop. And as you'll see in a moment, bacteria actually reproduce really quickly. So we can actually do a dilution on the agar plate. And if this doesn't work, I'll go through another technique in a minute. So we'd wipe it down here and then this side and then this side, and then by the time we get here, we can actually spread out. And this would be our sort of dilute area. Well, we can actually start counting and seeing what we've got. This would be our most concentrated. And each time that we're doing it, we're wiping more and more off, so we're actually diluting our sample onto the agar plate. So hopefully that sort of makes sense. And then we can go through and we can count them. And I'll go to a bit more about counting them in a moment. So just double check my notes. Yeah, when we're looking here, we've got this adhesive tape here. Now I know those I've taught, hopefully will remember some of this. Notice that this tape goes um, sort of top to bottom. It doesn't go all the way around. Now, it's really important we don't do this because what we don't want to do is seal off all of the air, all of the oxygen getting in um, from our container because a lot of the bacteria, they will produce, they become quite toxic and will only sort of reproduce and produce those toxins under anaerobic conditions. So we know that ourselves, if we start respiration anaerobically, we start producing lactic acid. We know that yeasts, um, they will produce alcohol. Some of the other bacteria produce some really nasty toxins. So in order to stay safe, we only put the tape top to bottom. We don't go all the way around. That's to make sure that oxygen can still get into the Petri dish. Now, what I would then be doing with this one is I'd be storing upside down. And in fact, I generally store them upside down all the time. Uh, and then when I want to take my sample, I will literally lift it off. I'll wipe the sample and I'll put it back onto the lid again. And that's to avoid contamination further. So if there is... 
Yeah, spot on, Olivia. Absolutely spot on. Uh, it is the one that we leave upside down. Now, the reason we leave it upside down is to avoid any contamination. Anything that drops into the lid uh, isn't then going to land on the jelly because actually gravity is going to keep, keep, hopefully, the contaminants down. So it just avoids contamination. Putting some tape on is quite useful. Um, when I've worked before with this one, I have seen someone manage to trip and throw an entire tray full of samples over the floor. Lids go everywhere. So we want to try and make sure that we do tape it. And also what we'll do is we will write what the sample is and the date on the bottom of it. So if the lid did come off, we still can identify that particular sample. In schools, our next step after this would be to incubate. And that just means it's put into, I'm going to say an oven. We're not looking at an oven to try and uh, cook it. We're actually looking at an oven just to try and help it grow. And in schools, this would be at 25 degrees Celsius. In industry, it's generally hotter. So if we're looking at it in industry, we would incubate anywhere between 35 and 40. And generally, this is just to try and make sure that we don't produce too many microorganisms. We don't produce too many pathogens. Um, and it's a way of protecting ourselves. But I mean, the incubators that we used to use, we had kept a 35. It's the temperature that most enzymes work best at. So we're going to get a much higher uh, production or multiplication of bacteria. So we'd incubate those higher temperatures. Now, if I just go over this side. <coughs> so once we've got our sample, what we're going to see is we're going to start getting different colonies growing on here. Now, what you might find if you've done the dilution on here is actually your initial colonies in a lot of these areas is too much to count. And there's loads on there. But hopefully we're going to get an area that's a bit more dilute. And what we can actually do is we can sort of section off our Petri dish. Um, sometimes we'll put them on top of a grid, so we'll actually have a grid underneath as well. And we can actually work out the area this is in. So we're not going to be able to work out the true value in the original sample because we don't know what our dilution is at this case, but it does give us an area of what's in there. Now, if we actually wanted to find out the population within a particular sample of liquid, what we would probably have to do is do a serial dilution of that sample. If we found out that actually there was too much bacteria for us to count, then we would do what they call a serial dilution. So if we had some containers, okay, we've got some containers. What we would do is if we had a sample in here, each time, so you say this was 10 mil, we would put one mil in and then we'd add nine mil of sterile water or whatever um, solution we need and that would go in there and then we could do it again that'd be another one mil and we could put nine mil again and we could keep diluting it down and each time our sample becomes uh, ten times more dilute so once we've done that what we could do is we could take our sample we could work out the area of the petri dish We can do that using pi r squared. So if we know the radius, we can work out the area. We can then count up the microorganisms in one particular area. So if we go for an exactly a quarter, and then we can multiply this back up to work out the total population in there. So it just gives us an idea. Now, there is a required practical. And the required practical uses antibiotics. I have seen... Uh, the same required practical completed, not just with antibiotics, but when we're looking at soaps as well. So we can use the sort of same idea. So although this is the required practical, 
the exam board is quite likely if this came up in an exam that they would look at tweaking it they would look at changing it and trying to get you to apply your knowledge now we just drop in this So what they've done in this case is rather than having a sterile agar plate, what they've done is they've started off with the agar sterile, but then they've inoculated it with the bacteria. So the bacteria is already living in the agar, but it hasn't been incubated yet, so it hasn't started multiplying too fast. What they've then done is they've taken these each one of these discs is either a disinfectant or an antibiotic, depending on the practical. So, I'll just put that down there, or an antibiotic. Now, this is going to prove the effectiveness of different types of antibiotics. And you can imagine this being used in a lab, in a hospital, if somebody has come in with certain symptoms and they want to find out which antibiotic is going to be best for treating the infection. Realistically, you could take some of that bacteria, you could swab it, you could grow it in some agar, and then you could put a disc containing different types of antibiotics onto the agar, and you could look at which one's going to be the most effective for treating that infection. And what you find is, in this case, this one here is going to be the most effective. And we can see that because actually it's got the biggest area around it where there's no bacteria that's living. So the bigger the area around the disc, and the discs are all the same size, they'll have the same concentration of each antibiotic. Um, but the area around it that doesn't have bacteria is going to prove to us how effective that antibiotic is and help us hopefully select the correct one. Gotta love this mug. Brilliant. Right, bacterial growth. One of the things that comes up, bacteria multiply roughly every 20 minutes under ideal conditions. So the numbers become huge very, very, very fast. And that's one of the things sort of we need to sort of keep in mind. We can start off with a very low number and very, very fast we end up with um, absolutely ridiculously huge amounts for this now we can show this on a graph again another exam board diagram so we can show this on a graph note this is log 10 so we are looking at massive numbers very very fast going from a very very small amount down here in very few number of hours. Now, the year 11s had a graph like this uh, fairly recently. The A lot of them were struggling to see what was going on. They were trying to talk about the, the numbers, and that's absolutely fine if that's what the question was after. What they wanted to know is why do they have these changes? So what you notice to start with is we've got this area here with sort of very, very slow growth. So the multiplication rate is very low. Uh, we've just put it in. They're going to start reproducing a little bit slower to start with. They've got to get used to the, or not, they get used. They've got to start absorbing those nutrients. Will the diffusion happen? They've got to get to the same temperature. They're basically getting used to their environment. Then very very quickly, we start getting this sort of exponential growth. We start getting this growth here. So the rate increases. So we have sort of maximum. Reproduction, multiplication, uh, here, reproduction, or division. So we have ideal temperatures, we have ideal conditions. Each one of those bacteria is going to start dividing every 20 minutes or so. Uh, that's going to make two, then we're going to go up to four, then eight, and, and it's going to go, and we get end up with our numbers getting to a level that's absolutely massive. Now, if this is in a sealed environment, very soon what happens we start using up 
the nutrients. So we're using up the nutrients and on top of that, we're going to build up of toxins. Now, if you think about us, actually, we produce um, lots of different toxins. We produce carbon dioxide from respiration. We produce uric acid from the breakdown of proteins. Living things are exactly the same thing. They're going to build up those toxins in their environment. And if there's nowhere for it to go, it's going to slowly get to the stage where it's going to start killing them. So we're not, our reproduction rate becomes effectively zero and they're going to start dying. Eventually this will decrease, but we're now not producing any more. So at the moment this is live, but I would expect this number to start decreasing after this because they have no nutrients left to feed on and the toxins that are built up are going to start killing them as well. We can see a very similar graph, obviously with different numbers, if we look at animals in the wild and plants. Because actually, ideal conditions, we get maximum reproduction rates. Uh, but eventually, the amount of nutrients, the competition for that is going to start. The competition is going to go up. The nutrients or the food is going to go down. If they're in a closed environment, we could have a toxin build up as well. But usually, it's just a lack of food. And those populations are going to go down. So this wouldn't just be for bacteria. But if you had a question like this, you need to start thinking about what's going to cause the graph to give this shape not just describing the shape depending on what the question's asking for right let's go on to a slightly different topic so i want to have a look at cell division i'm only going to cover mitosis today no not a problem at all good to see you Right, cell division. So I'm only going to look at mitosis now. Uh, we will come back to this as well. We'll do meiosis in later lessons. Uh, but it's quite nice to come back to it and do a bit of a recap later on. So mitosis, we are looking at normal cell division. So I often try to think of, use the T here for tissue. So we're looking at growth and repair. Because of this, we want all the daughter cells to be identical to the parent cell. Um, I don't know why they use the word daughter cells, uh, because at this stage, realistically, there's no gender to them, but we're just saying all of the cells that are produced are going to be identical to the parent cells. Now uh, we just shift that up a little bit more. So let's start off and let's just draw some of these out just so we've got something to work with. Right, so let's say for instance, and we'll keep this fairly simple to start with, we're going to have a couple of different types of chromosomes in the cell. We know that in human cells we have 46 chromosomes in pairs, so 23 pairs. But to try and keep this fairly simple, we're going to just draw it like that. Now normally, this would be, the DNA wouldn't look like chromosomes, it would all be sort of mixed up, it would be contained in the nucleus. When the cell wants to divide though, the nuclear membrane dissolves, uh, the chromosomes coil themselves up, or the DNA coils themselves up, so they become distinct chromosomes. Now, the first thing that has to happen before we can have any form of cell division is those chromosomes and cell organelles have to multiply. So they have to duplicate. So we often just talk about the genetic information multiplying, 
but realistically it has to be the cell organelles as well because if we didn't we'd end up with less and less mitochondria and ribosomes and everything else that makes up the cell that we went through last lesson and there wouldn't be enough to go on by the time we got through a few cell divisions so everything's going to reproduce at the same time so we're going to end up with Okay, so it's all, we're going down here and we end up with a replication of DNA and organelles. At this stage, and this bit often confuses students, although we actually technically have two strands, because they're still attached in the middle, we still count them as one chromosome even though there's two strands of dna it's not until they actually become separated at this stage uh, that we actually yeah we actually consider them as separate chromosomes at the moment they're still the same it just means we've got two strands of dna those strands should be identical assuming everything's gone okay and they'll be attached in the middle now for aqa you don't need to know the names of these processes and we don't need to go into lots of detail uh, the next stage that's going to happen though is they're going to line themselves up down the centre of the cell. And then what's going to happen is they're then going to be pulled to each end of the cell. Now again, at GCSE, you don't need to worry too much about this. But what we actually end up happening is we have these sort of microfilaments, which um, they appear from sort of each end of the cell. They attach themselves to the center of those chromosomes and they start to pull. And as they pull, what you end up with is the chromosome. Oh, hang on. Get rid of that. Back to that one. The chromosomes. Sorry. That's better. Uh, the chromosomes themselves, they get pulled to each end of the cell. Now, these are separate chromosomes now. They're no longer attached to each other, so we can call them separate chromosomes. And they're getting pulled to each end of the cell. And the cell itself is going to start cleaving in the middle. So we would actually end up with this cell would start cleaving here. And it's going to start forming uh, another cell. Uh, sorry, two separate cells. So this then is going to divide. So let me just draw that in as well. So they're going to divide. The nuclear membrane is going to reform again. And they're now two distinct cells. Now those cells will be a bit smaller to start with than the original ones. I think a lot of people think that all cells are the same size and they're really not. They're going to be a bit smaller and then those cells will gradually grow as everything inside them carries on multiplying, carries on reproducing and we get back up to a normal cell. And then those cells themselves can still divide. The key thing though is they're going to have the same genetic information, the same number of chromosomes, the same chromosomes themselves. Obviously just been replicated. Then the parent cell. And we're going to end up with two daughter cells for every one parent cell. And there's a key difference there between that and meiosis. So it's really important we get our heads around this. This is normal tissue production. This is not the production of sex cells. This is just growth and repair. It is you guys getting bigger, growing, um, building more muscles, more tissue samples. It is when you cut yourself and your body has to repair it. Um, it is when you do some exercise. And you start breaking down the muscles and you start using the muscles hard and your body has to build new muscle tissue. So it is that normal growth and repair, which is why the daughter cells have to be identical to the parent cell. It's really, really important you get your heads around that. And we make sure that's um, completely sort of uh, I suppose locked in stone. In the exam, if there is any doubt at all, because mitosis and meiosis are very close together in terms of the way they sound. And parts of the processes are quite similar at GCSE. If there is any doubt at all as to which one you mean, you won't get the mark for it. Okay, so it's really important you're very clear in your understanding. Um, 
yeah, in your understanding and the way you write that. So if you've got any questions on that, do put it in the comments box. I'm more than happy to go back through any part of it. Hi, Tanishka. Yeah, so I'm only going to do mitosis properly now because I want to make sure it's really clear. Um, meiosis is the production of sex cells. It's the producer, production of sperm and egg uh, or pollen in plants. Okay. So that's got to be really quite clear. When we, with mitosis, we're just looking at tissue. We're looking at normal growth and repair. And the process for it is we've got this idea that the uh, DNA replicates and the cell organelles so that we have two copies of everything. The DNA to start with is still attached in the middle of the chromosome. So it still counts as one chromosome. The chromosomes line up and they get pulled to each end of the cell and the cell, cell starts to divide into two. It then finishes off dividing, and we end up with two daughter cells with identical chromosomes uh, to the original, and then these cells will gradually grow. Uh, but the main thing is the DNA is exactly the same as the parent cell that we started from. So I'm not going to talk about the process of meiosis now, because I don't want you to get too confused. I want to make sure that this is really clear, first of all. So hopefully that's okay for you. Stem cells then. Uh, just done all that. Yeah, that's cool. So. Stem cell research. I'm going to say it's new. I think some of the developments are still new and we're still learning a lot about stem cells. Uh, but it's probably got, it's really, really cool in terms of medical advancements at the moment the things we can do and some of the diseases. So I'm going to spend a bit of time going through this now, talk about what they are, uh, some of the potential uses, some of the issues surrounding it as well. So when we drew our sort of animal and plant cells the other day, we sort of drew our animal cell. So let's just say we've got a nucleus, we've got some mitochondria in there. And we'll do some ribosomes. And we might have our plant cell. Again, we've got sort of permanent vacuole. We've got some mitochondria, got some ribosomes. And just because I can, I do this in green. And we've got some chloroplasts in there as well. Now, this isn't particularly specialized at the moment. So we would call these stem cells. So these are sort of undifferentiated. Or our stem cells. Okay. They have the ability to differentiate, to adapt, to turn into specialized cells, to turn into other types of cells. And that's where the sort of key use comes in. So I'm just going to start off with plant cells, which I think is the one that's possibly overlooked quite a lot. I know when I'm teaching, it's one of those, if I'm not really careful, I tend to miss. And it's really important we don't because actually the use of plant stem cells is actually really key still. So when we're looking at plants, the stem cells in plants, oh, I didn't done two S's. The stem cells in plants, we call, hang on, we've got the stem cells in plants, we call meristems. Now, generally we are looking at root tips. We are looking at the shoots uh, and we're also looking at the cells found between the xylem and the phloem. The last one's quite easy to miss, but it sort of makes sense because most people know that actually if we get a tree and we were sort of to chop it down and have a look and we were to count the number of rings, we can work out how old it is. So therefore, although we know that plants are growing upwards, they're also growing outwards. So there's got to be new tissue growth going outwards as well. So we've got these main types of meristem cells. Now, in plants, actually, there isn't much reason not to collect meristem cells because we can take cuttings, we can plant them, we can grow new plants, we can harvest the cells individually, 
we can put them into different compounds and we can grow them and actually with plants it's really useful to be able to clone the plant itself uh, and really quick and easy it doesn't actually destroy the plant in any way and we can get lots from it with very little effort so cloning is quite useful because actually if we had rare species uh, we could very quickly grow hundreds, if not thousands, of new ones from the meristem cells because we only need a few cells in order to clone it and grow a new species. If we had um, species that might have had, let's just say one of them is particularly disease resistant. Now, if we had a disease that was prolific in one particular area and we knew we could get some of those plants that were already disease resistant, we could grow lots of them very, very, very fast and then put them into that area. So quite useful from that point of view. So I just want to make sure that we've got everything down there. Yeah. So plants is really quite easy. The We don't need to worry too much about growing bits of the plant, like we would in humans and with animals, but it does mean that we can grow new plants. Now, if we're looking at animals, I'm going to put humans down here as well. I know we are an animal. But that's just to make, just to clarify. Just move that up. There we go. Realistically, when we're talking about ourselves, there are sort of two main types. We will start off with embryonic. Turn my watch off. Hopefully, the vibrate. You can't hear the vibration too much. Right. So we've got embryonic stem cells. So this is cells taken from an early stage embryo. Now, that embryo can be made from cells from the person. We can sort of clone. Uh, but the problem is it's going to destroy that embryo. Now, there are some issues ethically and religious for some people with this. Technically, that embryo has been grown for this purpose. It is not alive at that point. Technically. Some people would argue, though, that if the embryo was allowed to carry on, then it would become a living thing. So therefore, by taking those cells, by pulling them apart, we are destroying that embryo. Now, it doesn't matter at this stage what you believe. What's really important is that you can argue both cases or all the different arguments for this one. Put it across a coherent argument and then be able to give your viewpoint as well. But if you only come up with a one-sided argument, for instance, if you were very of the firm belief that we shouldn't be doing this because we're killing an embryo, and that was the only argument you could give, you'd be limiting yourself to, um, in any sort of extended answer question. So we need to make sure that we can appreciate both sides of the argument for that. So we're looking at cells from an early stage embryo. Now we know that actually this embryo is formed when we have the sort of sperm plus the egg, they combine to form a zygote, which is the name of that first cell, and then it's going to start multiplying to become an embryo. At that stage, it is a bundle of cells, and all the cells look identical. There is absolutely zero specialization. But that bundle of cells is going to keep multiplying, and it's going to start becoming specialized. So different cells are going to become specialized in different ways, depending on the tissue type. And if you think about all of the different cells and tissues that makes up your body, all of those would have come from an embryo. So the embryonic stem cells are the most useful. In other words, they can differentiate into the most number of or the biggest different number of different types of cells. So we'll just put differentiate the greatest or the most. Okay, so they're going to multiply the most. Uh, really, really useful from that point of view. Also, if the embryonic stem cells are taken or produced from that person, there's no chance of rejection. Because your body is going to think about them as being their own. So we're not going to reject them in any way, shape or form. So we massively, massively useful. We've got these cells that we can turn into pretty much anything else once we know how. And that's a big thing. We still don't know how to turn them into all different types of cells. We're getting better at it. 
but we're, we've got a long way to go, so we still need to do re a lot of research on this. Uh, there's no chance of rejection if we were to produce some different tissue types, and I'll come back to the uses in a moment. But we are killing the embryo at that point. We're pulling the cells apart. Um, so for some people, there is an ethical, there is a religious um, issue there, because are we killing a life form? And that's a point that you need to be able to argue. We can then take adult stem cells. So adult stem cells, for instance, can be taken from bone marrow. Now, this is quite useful because actually we can produce red blood cells quite quick and easy from bone marrow stem cells. We can take stem cells from other parts of the body, but they're much harder to get. We generally collect them in lower amounts. So we've got lower numbers. Um, they're harder. Can be painful. Um, collection of bone marrow in particular. You've got to drill into the bone. You've got to extract the bone marrow. It can be quite painful. Now, they're also, they are limited into the number of types of cells they can turn into. So, for instance, if we're looking at bone marrow, we've got red blood cells, we've got a few others, but it's not as useful as the embryonic. But on the plus side, we're not killing an embryo to get them. Now, that's got to be quite clear, because actually we can get them quite easy. The adult can give consent, we're not killing anyone. Um, we can get them, we can harvest them, we can extract them. Yeah, it's going to hurt. Uh, they're not as useful, but we haven't got that embryo that's been destroyed. Or we can, get an we can do the embryonic ones, uh, very easy to get hold of, very easy to make, massively useful, can get huge amounts of cells, but we've got to kill the embryo. So it's one of those sort of ethical dilemmas that it's worth considering and making sure that you can talk about both sides of the argument when it comes to that. So, let's just move this down here somewhere. So we start looking at the uses then. We can grow new tissue types. So we can look at replacing new tissue, new organs, eventually. Uh, we can't quite get to organs yet, as far as I'm aware of. I'll do a bit more research on that one. But we can grow basically different tissue types. We can grow nerves. We can grow um, skin cells. We can grow red blood cells. So very uh, quite quickly, we can actually come up with these different tissue types. So some of the things they're looking at using at the moment, we are looking at diabetes. We're looking at paralysis. So if you think from a diabetes point of view, uh, if we're looking at the inability of the body to produce insulin, well, actually, if you could... Uh, reproduce the cells that produce the insulin in the pancreas and you can put those into the pancreas then the body can start producing insulin again if we're looking at damaged nerves in the form of paralysis if we can actually grow new nerves put them into the body and attach them then we can actually treat paralysis and there has actually been some very successful sort of development in those areas at the moment so that's quite common you can think about if someone was blind if it was a nerve issue or if it was to do with um, issues with some of the receptors in the eye then theoretically we can grow those cells we can put them back in the body can start using them and we can actually start reversing some of those diseases some of those issues so some really really cool medical advancements coming from stem cells and it's worth keeping an eye on the news and it's worth doing the research if you're interested in this because it's developing quite rapidly and there is just some amazing things that are being done uh, the other thing we've got and I mean I mentioned it earlier We've got sort of no rejection. So if we can grow another organ, if we can grow new tissue types, that person doesn't have to be on anti-rejection medication for the rest of their lives because the body's not going to re reject it because it's made of their own tissue types if it's made from embryonic or even with adult, if we can do it, if we can get the right cells. So very quite very useful from that point of view. There is one other issue though. Now, this, I haven't seen this come up in exams before, but that generally means it probably will at some point. If we are thinking about viruses, now, I know issues we've had on here already. We've obviously got the sort of pain we're looking at adult. Um, we've got some of the ethical issues. Uh, where are we looking at? 
Yeah, so the ethical issues up there. I'm not going to scroll the way back up there. But if we think about viruses for a minute. Quite topical at the moment, viruses. We know that viruses live inside cells. They are not a living thing in themselves. They're sort of parasitic. They live inside cells. They use the cells normal organize, um, organelle structures to reproduce themselves and they multiply inside a cell and then when that cell uh, is full they burst open and those viruses will then basically spread to other cells so one of the things we have to be careful of is that actually if we take stem, some stem cells and we start reproducing it we need to make sure there's no viruses in that cell to start with because if there is, as we let those cells replicate, we're going to be replicating the viruses with them. So there is a potential here for virus transfer. So when we're doing our screening, we need to make sure that actually we have screened them to make sure there are actually, there are actually no viruses inside them at all. So quite an important one. And it's one that I hadn't even considered until uh, the other day when I was sort of putting some bits and pieces together for this one. And actually, yeah, it makes quite a lot of sense. Any questions on any of that? Okay, so just double checking, we have pretty much covered everything in cells one and two. Now, I'm just literally looking through the spec at the moment, making sure I've not missed anything. But no, sorry, so. Good question. So Tanisha's just asked, actually, when we kill a virus by medicines, do we have to kill the whole cell? Not always. Not always, because actually a lot of the medication then otherwise would be a bit like chemo where it, don't, it would affect all the cells, but it will have an adverse effect on the cell. So viruses are really hard to get. I mean, if you think about antibiotics, they can don't have to go into normal cells. They can focus specifically on the bacteria because they are a cell in themselves. But when we look at viruses, because viruses live inside the cell, the biggest problem we've got is getting the medication to the virus. And actually, because the virus doesn't have lots of the same organelles that we do, because they rely on using the cells inside the organelles inside your cell, trying to kill them is very, very difficult. Now, I don't know if you've had a look at uh, the I don't so the news that Southampton University have been they've been doing quite a lot of work based on the coronavirus recently. Funnily enough. Uh, one of the areas is to produ producing lots more sort of protective equipment for doctors and nurses and frontline workers. But they've also been looking at different medical trials and one of the, they've had some success, and I don't know how far this has gone at the moment, but they've had some success using interferon, which is like an anti-AIDS treatment. Now, that's been proving very, very effective to treat the coronavirus, which sort of makes sense. I mean, don't get me wrong, I couldn't tell you the ins and outs of how this works, but they are both viruses. So there's been some development on that one. And I think what we will find is as we look into more and more of the sort of virus treatments, I'm not necessarily sure whether it kills the virus or just alleviates the symptoms. But it's something I'm going to do more research and I'll try and provide a bit more back for you on that one. But yeah, so some of the antiviral treatments doesn't necessarily kill the cell, um, but it does help alleviate some of the symptoms of the virus on that one. But it's worth doing a bit, bit of research into that. Brilliant. Right. I know we've got about six minutes to go. I've pretty much covered all of that. So Friday, I'm going to go back through and have a look at the second half of Waves. I'm particularly going to focus on the triple content, though, because there's some areas in there that are a bit more complicated that I want to make sure we finish to wrap that up. Uh, and then after that, I think I'll probably do Chemistry 1 because I've not done a Chemistry topic yet. So it'd be quite nice to go through and do the Chemistry 1, so atomic structure and looking at the periodic table as well hopefully that's been of use to you guys and hopefully you are all doing well staying inside staying safe uh, any questions drop me an email drop me a note on google classroom and let me know how i can help take care